So we're continuing with chapter three. Uh, this is our third page of notes. And these two pages, page three and four, will deal with China. So just like with India, we mentioned some geographic features. Uh, same with China. Uh, they include mountain ranges such as the Himalayas uh, that border with India uh, on the southwest part of China. There's thick jungles, the Gobi Desert that is between China and Mongolia today, and the Pacific Ocean on the east and southeast uh, coast of China. China is, or was, the most isolated of the civilizations that we've talked about so far. Um, that isolation contributed to the belief, at least for the Chinese, that China was the center of the earth. And I think for many early groups, that's probably true, that they felt their civilization was uh, the center and everything else was out away from that. Okay, some of the main regions in China, we have the Huanghe or Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Uh, or Changjiang, as it's called in China. We have those two river valleys, uh, very important to uh, getting uh, water supplies to people uh, downstream, especially uh, anciently. Less is a fine windblown yellow soil. Um, so again, these rivers provided irrigation and transportation routes and uh, the Yellow River is named so because of that yellow soil, uh, but as the wind blew and, and deposited this soil on the ground, it uh, helped out the farm ground, helped to enrich the soil, and allowed them to continue to grow crops on it. We start out with uh, the Shang Dynasty, and one fact or one thing that led to the formation of some of these uh, governments or these uh, dynasties would be the fact that they, they needed a strong central government to control these rivers. They had to have organization in order to um, you know, make these pro projects work as they were trying to control the river. Um, 1750 to 1045 BC, that's in the new book. The old book was uh, 100 years shorter than that. During this time, Chinese civilization first took shape. Uh, the word clan are groups of families who claimed a common ancestor. Uh, I don't really think we use that name a lot today. Maybe with, you know, you might hear it with Ireland and some of the clan gatherings that they talk about there. Um, so actually before the Shang Dynasty, we have the beginning was with the Sia, X-I-A, the Sia dynasty. But, however, little is known about that group. So as far as our writing, we're going to start with the Shang dynasty. They had uh, large palaces, rich tombs. Women had considerable power in this uh, dynasty. Um, kind of a smaller area, again, compared to what China is today, as you can see on that map. Um, and this area probably would have been similar to some of the city-states of Sumer that we talked about in chapter 2. Oracle bones were some of the oldest of Chinese writing uh, was found on these. Um, it was done on animal bones or turtle shells. Um, what, the way they worked is the priest would write a question to the gods on the bone or the shell. Uh, the bone or shell was then heated through either a hot metal rod or possibly putting it in a fire and heating it. And then they would wait until it cracked and then the priest would look at these cracks and interpret them. And that would be the answer from the gods. Um, these, these answers also, uh, I guess, provided or at least um, they said it was advice from their ancestors. Uh, ancestor worship is very important in many Asian societies. Um, I think some of this calligraphy eventually led to, um, or some of these early writing led to calligraphy. 
um, and also some bronze casting. The next one is the Zhao or Jiao. It's kind of a soft CH, Chow, Jiao. Um, again, our newer book, 1045 to 256 BC. The older book was 1027 BC. This group overthrew the Shangs. Uh, they justified their rebellion by promoting the idea of the mandate of heaven, um, which is, or the, the divine right to rule. So they felt that the authority to command the government came from heaven. And so the cruelty of the last Shang king, they declared, had so outraged the gods that they had sent ruin on them in allowing the Chao dynasty to come in and take over from the Shang dynasty. So the dynastic cycle is the rise and fall of dynasties. Uh, from the beginning, beginning of Chinese history up until about 1912, I think it was, uh, a young boy came to power. He was the last Chinese emperor. Uh, the mandate of heaven was expanded to explain um, the dynastic cycle. So, you know, as one family came to power, they rose up, ruled for maybe centuries, um, as some did. Then, if the next group felt like they were ruling unjustly, then they could step in and take over based on the mandate of heaven. And so it would fall, and then the next one would go up. And so the, the rise and fall of these dynasties is that dynastic cycle. Uh, reward to the Zhao supporters by granting control over different regions. Uh, this kind of led to a feudalism, a system of government in which local lords governed their lands but owed military service to a greater lord. So there's the greater lord, then you have uh, the local lords that would have the right to, to not, not ownership, but uh, the right to, to run or to use that parcel of land. But in exchange for that use, they would have to provide military service. Whether they went themselves and fought or whether they had other people under them that they sent out to fight. Um, Later, this was developed quite a bit in, in Japan, but I think more extensively in, in Europe. Uh, the Middle Ages, we'll, we'll talk about with knights and castles and uh, feudalism and vassals and lords and kings and all of that. Some of the Chinese achievements, they had an accurate calendar. It was actually 365 and a quarter days like we have now. Uh, I'm not sure if they did something like we have leap year where the, every fourth year we take care of that extra day that's built up. Uh, silk making was very important. They made some of the first books, art, technology, or and the technology of bronze making. So again with the silk, um, well let's mention it on the next one. So that leads to the Silk Road. This was a trade route uh, that linked China with the Middle East. Quite a an extensive road from the Middle East to China. Uh, silk was China's most valuable export. Uh, the Chinese tried to keep the knowledge of how to make silk uh, as secret as they could for as long as possible because once that secret was out, then, then they didn't have the control. If, if you're the only one that knows how to make it, uh, you can pretty much demand whatever price you want for that item like silk. Uh, but once that knowledge was out, then it was just another piece of cloth to, to really anybody else. So that finishes up our third page. Thank you.